a little context about me. Um, I'm not an engineer, and um, my background really is in economic development, and I'm a urban planner by training. Um, most recently, um, actually, I worked with Mark. He was the Mayor Nutter's first sustainability director, and we got to start the office and put together Greenworks, which was Philadelphia's first sustainability plan. And um, I guess through that work and a lot of the energy efficiency um, recovery money that I got involved in, I also just got very interested in energy and the opportunity. And I'll get into a little bit um, why, from a policy perspective, I was especially attracted, I think, to the smart grid. So there's just a few general points that I've been thinking about or I certainly want to make during the presentation, and if I don't go into them enough, I guess just ask me. Um, again, you know, and as we've just heard, um, Garrison has really reinforced the fact for me, and someone referred to it before, that the people element in energy is always going to be really important. And what my company does, and there's a lot of technology out there now, and it's all emerging, it's very exciting. And it, it, it does its best to take the human element out and automate as much as possible. And that's fantastic, but people will always be really important, even if you have as much automation as you can create. Um, and the second kind of big point I want to make, based on my experience over the past year, is that um, the smart grid is a great strategy <laughs> to make buildings more efficient. And my um, experience so far is that the kind of tables talking about smart grid technology and the tables talking about energy efficiency right now are kind of separate. And the more that we can bring them together um, from a policy perspective um, and an implementation perspective, that would be really good. And one of the, um, I guess this will illuminate why I asked that question earlier. For me, as a policy person, one of the things I really like about energy is actually incentive, direct incentives exist that provide really direct economic benefit to change your behavior. So it's similar to if um, you, know, you were paid to take public transit right now. In a way, you're paid in some aspects to reduce your energy use. And that, that's a really attractive thing if you're trying to get people to change their behavior. Um, and finally, I just mentioned technology um, is important, but human behavior will always have a big place at this table. And finally, um, I think, and you know, maybe you can help us, me, with that, with this issue as I move through the presentation or afterwards. Figuring out a way to communicate all the opportunity and all the ways you can take advantage of all this innovation from the energy sector is really challenging. I feel like right now the sector is filled with a lot of people who have been in it for a long time. And they're not really used to um, communicating with consumers. And the more we can simplify the message and make it simple and engaging, the more we can get people actually doing some of these things that you know we'd all like to see. So. Um, I think where we are right now is at the beginning of a whole cultural change around energy. There's a lot of things happening right now that are making people more engaged in their decision making. And again, the smart grid is really all this innovation in information technology and telecommunications. And it allows you to make many more decisions about how you're going to use your energy. Um, also, in states like Pennsylvania, they recently deregulated, so now you can choose where you're going to get your supply. And just that process in itself really forced people who had never really spent a lot of time thinking about how they use electricity to think a lot more about it. It forced people to get more educated, and I think that's a really good thing. So now everyone has this kind of greater baseline of understanding of, you know, this isn't just a passive thing you're doing you actually can make many more decisions, and they're going to be good for you and hopefully good for the world. Um, my company was founded by a group of executives from PJM, which is the largest grid in the world. And um, 
they basically left because they wanted to create tools that would give consumers the same advantages that generators had when taking, um, to be able to use the wholesale markets. And so there, the whole kind of vision behind my company's technology is really consumer empowerment. And another um, important point that's really reinforcing that is um, in March, the federal government, FERC specifically, <coughs> made a ruling that a megawatt has the same value as a megawatt. And I'll show you how that works um, in a slide in a second. But basically, load from a generator is valued the same as load from a building. So that's a really, really big deal and provides uh, an additional market incentive to get involved. This is our existing grid. And um, many of you do obviously know what this is. Um, right now, and traditionally, the grid has always been a one-way street, and we have the supply side. What's new over there, of course, is the renewables, and we have central generating power plants. And then we have the demand side, which has always been us, the consumers. And so the, the role of the grid and your local utility is always to keep supply and demand in balance, and there's a bunch of tools that the grid has to do this, which is um, the wholesale power markets, the way they ask different generators to turn on and off their supply. And what my company does and what a lot of new innovation is focused on is making the demand side, which is you know, our buildings, the end user, a source of supply. So now, that, so now the grid actually is going to be much more of an interactive, two-way system, and it's becoming much more localized rather than centralized. And I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with the wholesale energy markets that exist in this country, but um, these are them, and they kind of set the price in these areas of the country. In the other parts of the country, it's really done more locally. And of course, we're in the New York ISO, which is, um, you know, a very sophisticated operating grid, and PJM is actually the largest grid in the country. Um, they, they probably are the most consumer friendly as far as encouraging participation from the demand side of the meter. And I think FERC is now pushing, they all have different market rules, which if you're a company trying to develop products that can be used on the demand side, obviously makes it pretty confusing. So the federal government is also, in order to create more demand side participation, pushing for much more unified um, market rules across the country so there can be even more kind of participation and innovation. Um, obviously, we're in a very congested area of the country. It's, um, there's a lot of people here. It's hard to build new generation, and also prices are really high. So this is a big focus. There's a lot of demand, maybe more here than in some other parts of the country as far as ways to reduce energy consumption on the customer side of the meter and a lot of interest. And so this is kind of our vision and in a way the vision of the smart grid, which we all acknowledge in the industry is not well defined. Um, it's kind of misused a lot. A lot of people just think of smart meters when you say smart grid. And what this is really trying to show is that the central power plant that we're used to is just one component of a power system with the advances in innovation, technology, and communication tools allows communities themselves, cities, to develop their own power systems. And we really view the key building blocks of a smart grid to be controllable building load, renewables, on-site generation and storage. And then you can start to think about and talk about how you can take strategies in those building blocks and apply them to neighborhoods, cities. We all know the military is very interested in this um, due to reliability and security issues. So um, especially with the um, growth and onset of electric vehicles, keeping all of this in balance and integrated so that our central grid is able to supply power is going to become even more challenging. So communication tools are gonna to continue to be really important. 
So um, a little bit, I don't, I'm not sure how many people here are familiar with how the markets work and what demand response is. So I'm gonna try to illustrate it a little bit. Right now, um, basically, there, the grid sometimes needs more load than it can get from the supply side. And so sometimes they'll call an event, it's called demand response. And that's when they'll ask, like during the hottest days of the summer, for buildings to basically load shed and provide some supply back to the grid. And with the advances in technology, there's actually many more times of the year that you can now do that and you don't have to rely on the grid calling for more supply. You can actually look at the prices yourselves in real time and day ahead and call your own event as a customer and generate revenues. So now, basically, the wholesale markets become something that you can take advantage of through information about price. And so what we're trying to do as a company is using forecasts and pricing signals, provide the customer with as much information as a generator would have. So you're not just responding to an event, maybe the one time out of the summer when the grid needs more load, but you can put load in many more times the year and effectively make your infrastructure assets their own generators. So that's kind of the big concept. And so um, there's a few ways I think you can think about kind of how your building can be an asset. And right now, you know, obviously there's energy efficiency, which is static. So you're just trying to make improvements to reduce. Then there's demand response, which is really, you know, a grid directed call for more load. And then there's something called dynamic demand optimization, when you're much more engaged with the grid and the pricing, and you're using your assets in a much more interactive way, you're much more active about the decision making. And so you can really take advantage of that as a customer. So, and the, the, the smart grid has both economic and environmental benefits. And I think this is an illustration just about how demand response itself can really benefit the public as a whole. So this is um, a week in August, you know, it was probably the hottest week of the summer that year. And you can see that um, without customers basically load shedding through demand response, the price would have hit that peak at that week. And by all that demand response and load, set, load shedding participation, the price actually came down here. And not just for people who were participating in demand response, for everyone. So the more people we can get to participate in the markets, they're gonna bring down the price at the wholesale level and therefore the retail level as a whole. And one of the reasons that is, is because, you know, on the hottest days of the summer when the grid is at its peak, they have to put on all their sources of generation and that dries up the price. And some of those sources are not clean sources. And so the more you can get dispatch saved load from the customer side of the meter to be a source into the grid, the less you really need to rely on some of the sources that we don't like if we care about carbon. And so now I'm just gonna illustrate a little bit how this works in some projects we're doing just to kind of give you some direct examples. So this was our first project um, and we were partnered with Pico and their big um, stimulus smart grid grant. So we're working on six Oh, okay. So um, anyway, we're working on um, now 10 buildings at Drexel, but this was one day in July of last year. And basically that's the top line is how the buildings would have performed without veridity. And the bottom line is how they performed with our services. So this is through temperature reductions and some pre-cooling. So there's some real economic value that you can see in those buildings. And then there's just pure energy savings through um, less use. 
Um, we're, we're working with Con Ed on their smart grid grant, doing a big microgrid with solar storage um, building load at the Brooklyn Navy Terminal. And they're adding more sites um, at the bottom of New York City. And this is all about for Con Ed, obviously, reliability is a huge issue. So they identified sites in their system where they needed feeder relief. And so that's where they really want to see load shedding and kind of distributed, gener distributed generation investments really occur. And then uh, the last project I'll talk about is we're working with SEPTA. Um, this is pretty interesting. We're basically turning their subway trains into hybrids by installing a wayside storage device. So instead of a battery on the subway car, we're installing it at a substation. It turns out that trains, when they break, generate electricity. And it, you know, if you don't store it, it dissipates into the third rail and is wasted. So we're going to store it in a battery. And then when prices are high, we're going to sell it back to the grid. And it turns out we're going to, I think this is the first time SEPTA can generate revenues out of its assets rather than um, you know, further debt. So it's a pretty interesting pilot that we want to basically expand to their whole system. And then finally, I just wanted to talk a little bit about how this relates to place. And so now that um, you, know, you can see we, there's a transit system, there's a university, we're working with a major mm -hmm. downtown hospital in Philadelphia. And so how can you build these individual projects into place-based strategies? Some of that innovation is starting to happen across the country, in particular um, Pecan Street. I know there's a lot of people involved in housing here, and they're focused on the residential sector. And so um, we're, we're really interested in leveraging technology to aggregate loads within cities and neighborhoods so that customers really see the benefits. And so obviously, Philadelphia and New York both have strategies now around energy efficiency and sustainability and create new regulations that make kind of a smart city, smart grid effort um, really start to make sense. And then, of course, we have the federal government as a partner. I think the FERC ruling gives us a lot more momentum. And the more that some of the groups here can really kind of engage more in that policy sector and get the word out, that now is a great time to start to think about smart grid. I, I think we're, we'll really start to build some momentum. Okay.